So <clears throat> that brings us to the end of um, the classification uh, discussion, right? So and typically to and also to the end of uh, this course. Um, so I kind of want to you know f leave you with a final summary of uh, all that we have seen in this course so far. Um, so we started with the problem of unsupervised learning um, and we said that you know there are diff three different major types of unsupervised learning. One was representation learning for which we saw PCA and kernel PCA. Uh, then we looked at uh, clustering for which we saw the k-means algorithm and of course uh, I said that you can also extend k-means uh, to a kernel version which is called as a spectral clustering algorithm. Um, and then we looked at estimation as part of so unsupervised learning where we looked at maximum likelihood Bayesian methods and uh, mixture models specifically focusing on the EM algorithm. Uh, and then we moved on to supervised learning. We started with regression. We put down the ordinary least squares based regression algorithm. Then we looked at, you know, ridge regression, lasso. Um, and then we moved on to classification and we have seen a host of algorithms, right? From k nearest neighbors, decision trees, uh, logistic regressions, perceptron, support vector machines, bagging, boosting, and now uh, at a high level neural networks as well. <clears throat> so with this, I hope that, um, we have a very solid uh, foundational material covered for uh, machine learning um, and now you should be able to you know um, smoothly transition to you know easily implementing these algorithms in practice um, either I mean you learn more if you're taking a machine learning uh, practice course um, and also you'll be able to smoothly transition to a deep learning course where you'll be able to appreciate the algorithms much better than perhaps taking that before such a course before looking at the machine learning course. Um, let me also uh, briefly comment that you know <coughs> what is uh, what are things that we did not look at it in, look at in this course um, which are some things that uh, interested uh, audience can also look up. Um, we did not cover a um, couple of things. So one thing we did not cover is uh, semi-supervised learning. We looked at supervised learning and unsupervised learning, but then there is something in between called as semi-supervised learning where you have supervision for some data points, but then you also have some unsupervised data points. We did not cover that. Um, again, with, with the understanding of whatever we have covered in this course, you should be able to pick up those things if need be. Uh, we did not look at self-supervised learning, which is another variant of, <coughs> you know, especially in a deep learning context, uh, when the data is uh, uh, scarce, you can kind of create um, new data from existing data using self-supervision techniques. Um, that is something that we did not cover um, with, with respect to paradigms. Um, we also did not cover sequential decision making, which is perhaps hopefully at some point will be a separate course itself, uh, where the problem is very similar, just that, you know, here we are, we always start with the assumption that I have x1, y1 till x and yn, right? So you are given a bunch of data and then you need to do something with this data. Whereas in a sequential decision making problem, <clears throat> your data comes one at a time. And then you have to make a decision for the point that you are right now looking at and uh, you'll be given feedback whether it was correct or not. And then over time you have to learn good, uh, you, you have to learn good strategies to predict well and so on and so forth. Um, so there is an entire uh, course that can be taught on sequential decision making. Hopefully at some point we will uh, do that course also as part of this <coughs> uh, online BSc program. So that is something that we have not seen in this course. Um, and uh, certain other things which are as follow-ups might be interesting for people who want to look at something more advanced, um, uh, especially right now in state of the art um, machine learning conferences focuses on a couple of uh, interesting things, uh, which are what I call as uh, techniques for deployable machine learning, deployable AI slash ML. Um, so, so what we have learned in this course is one piece of an entire pipeline in a, in a, in a practical setup, right? So we have seen the most important part, which is the algorithmic part. Now, when you, uh, when you take this algorithm and try to deploy <coughs> it on the field, uh, several issues might crop up. Uh, let me point out a few issues. I'm not going to talk about the solutions to these issues now, but then I, at least uh, just to um, <coughs> make you more curious about these topics, uh, let me give you some, point out some issues. 
uh, one issue might be the issue of uh, fairness right so for example um, uh, let's say um, uh, this uh, so one common example that is often given is um, uh, a, a, a machine learning based system which was trying to predict some risk score uh, for uh, you know criminals uh, of course in the us uh, <coughs> this was used at some point um, this was a system an ml system which would predict a risk score for a criminal for recommitting a crime and then coming back to the uh, to the prison uh, what is the chance that this person would recommit a crime right so it, it used a lot of features of this person or their previous crime uh, records and so on and so forth and then it would predict a uh, predict a score for that uh, now it so happened that uh, such a system um, started learning um, to predict scores uh, which were not which were favorable to uh, one ethnicity of criminals whereas it was not favorable to a different ethnicity of criminals uh, but then we know that you know um, uh, risk score should not be associated to ethnicity it should be associated to the nature of crimes committed in the past and so on and so forth um, but the problem here is uh, <clears throat> the the algorithm started picking up uh, ethnicity as a feature which can be used to make such bad predictions now why did this happen well there is nothing in the algorithm like a logistic regression on svm which is biased to one group of population than others uh, the problem though here comes because um, the bias is actually in the data right so if your data or the previous judges who had given judgment uh, were biased towards one ethnicity than other and then they had you know uh, given higher um, risk scores for one ethnicity than other or higher uh, prison uh, uh, time for one ethnicity than others then any algorithm that learns based on biased data is also going to produce biased outputs so the question it's a big question today right so if you deploy ai uh, in a in a real world scenario you should really ask the question is the ai that i am deploying really responsible really um, <coughs> doing the right thing is it fair Right. So now question of fairness is a meta question. It's not necessarily the algorithm that is unfair. It is the data that could be unfair. Right. So, so algorithm. So can we make fair algorithms? This is one important question uh, that 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 is still being discussed and we have some solutions at this point and it's still a research area. Uh, second point. Right. So is um, as we saw today, right? So neural networks um, are slightly a much more complicated, uh, you know, beast than um, a, a linear regression, right? So, for example, because of a lot of non-linearity involved and so on and so forth. Well, while these algorithms might give you very good accuracy, now the question that uh, one should answer is: uh, Can we use this in mission-critical applications? Let's say you are a healthcare uh, professional. Let's say you are a doctor. Um, and then you are trying to prescribe a particular medication to a patient and then um, you are taking help of a neural network to make you uh, give you suggestions right so and let's say the neural network says hey this uh, patient should be prescribed a particular medicine right so i'm just making up this example but then uh, let's say such a situation arises um, now as a doctor uh, you should know why did the algorithm make this decision Right. So, if it's a simple decision tree based algorithm, then the algorithm can say it not only gives you um, the, the actual output as to whether a particular medication should be taken or not, it also tells you why it arrived at such a decision. Because a particular feature was less than certain threshold, particular feature was greater than certain threshold and so on and so forth, you can trace down the decision tree to its leaf and then that's just a set of, <coughs> you know, if then else conditions. Now, that is a very explainable way to make predictions on the other hand a very complicated hundred layer hidden layer neural network if you ask why did you make this prediction now that's there is no simple way to make this explanation right so because the, the model itself is inherently very very complicated so now <clears throat> um, now how can as a doctor i i can be very confident about using the prediction that a neural network does or let's say we are using neural networks to or, or some complicated algorithm to um, uh, to to design self-driving cars 
right so now uh, the car uh, some some passenger walks in front of the car the car is supposed to apply brakes but it does not and then the car jams into the passenger let's say unfortunately the passenger dies now um, now we have to ask the question why was the brake not applied right so it's a decision problem that the algorithm has solved and then it has decided not to apply brakes right so but then how do who should be held accountable first of all right so how can we make the model explain its decision right so if the model cannot explain this decision in a simple way in a human understandable way then how can we decide who should be blamed for this model is this the person who wrote the algorithm uh, or is it because <clears throat> certain type of training method was used and what what should be i mean who should be held accountable it's not at all clear right so these are questions which needs more thinking about and people are dabbling with these questions as we speak um, so this is a very important area of uh, machine learning that people are looking at called the explainable uh, ai explainable machine learning so fairness is one explainability is one <coughs> And of course, people want um, um, another important uh, thing in uh, deployable machine learning is privacy. For example, I have a very good algorithm, uh, but then, you know, if the algorithm is kind of leaking information about the data points, uh, maybe it's um, these are confidential information. Maybe this is my uh, salary information or maybe it is my health records based on which the algorithm is trying to, you know, predict something in general, learn a model. Um, now, if maybe as a as a patient, I may not be happy to, you know, provide information to a machine learning algorithm if the algorithm potentially might leak information about my health status. I don't want the algorithm to do that, right? So, which means that can we develop machine learning algorithms which are private, right? So, if so, what is the definition of privacy? How can we define privacy and so on and so forth before you deploy certain algorithms right so privacy is a is another a big question that people talk about all the time um, the other point uh, which is also of interest is as neural networks become larger and larger um, and, and we make more and more complicated models uh, <clears throat> question of um, you know if you want to bring these models to a phone right so which is in your pocket uh, which has limited memory mind you uh, no matter no no matter how fast it is right so <coughs> it is the memory might still be limited especially when you think of neural network billions of parameters right so how can we put such a complicated model into um, into low memory uh, resources right um, so can we kind of truncate the precision of neural networks um, can we subsample can we do something right so how can we make you know small neural networks which kind of mimic the large neural networks these are questions that people researchers have been asking um, which i can call as a for edge right so that is one interesting um, direction of uh, that people are looking at as well um, <coughs> the other thing which is uh, which is always important is because once you deploy your models on the field um, now it is all you've learned is from training data but then your test data might gradually change over time, right? So maybe you are, uh, you have a model which is, um, uh, which is to predict which team in an IPL match will win uh, based on previous, uh, you know, scores and players statistics that you have. You have built a model, uh, and now you are using that to make predictions. But what might happen is over time, people's skills might change, teams might change, all sorts of things might happen. And so the distribution and so the the way people play against each other uh, might be completely different from what the data that your model has learned from. So how can we continuously make the model make changes, right? So now you cannot retrain your model from scratch every time a new data point comes in. How can you kind of uh, do this um, learning seamlessly after you have done your deployment um, are, are also questions of interest, right? So to summarize, you have several, you know, post deployment questions to take care of um, including fairness explainability uh, privacy <coughs> um, you know distributed uh, learning which i did not talk about too much but that's also another interesting thing um, a for edge um, and and transfer learning which is how to transfer the knowledge from one domain to another domain or continuous learning um, how do you learn keep on learning after you have deployed the models. So these are all several interesting directions that as a learner, um, I would suggest all of you to, you know, think about and read about. Um, these are all, you know, state of the art uh, techniques that people are 
you know developing as we speak um so so i hope uh, there are there are so many things that uh, you can do after finishing this course um, as i said this is an introductory course uh, the goal of this course is to give you a solid foundation so that you are prepared to take take up all these slightly advanced courses um, uh, and courses which deal with state of the art algorithms like the deep learning course for unstructured data um, or you can look at uh, research works going on um, in that in, in several areas that I just listed in uh, deployable AI. So with this, uh, I would like to conclude uh, my, my uh, talk today and uh, we'll finish this course here. Um, <clears throat> I sincerely hope all of you had a good time uh, listening to these lectures and hopefully you learned something useful from this course. Um, so all the best and uh, until we see uh, in a different course, um, um, Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, see you soon. Bye.